Hello, and welcome to our fourth lecture in cognitive neuroscience. We're continuing uh, discussing how neurons function. In the previous lecture, we talked about the cellular membrane and the processes that maintain um, a charge across the cellular mem membrane. We call that the sort of resting membrane potential. And now we're going to talk about um, how ne uh, neurotransmission occurs via generation of uh, ele an electrical signal known as the action potential. So I want to start uh, first by a quick overview of postsynaptic potentials. We call excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. Talk about the action potential itself. Uh, a summary of the movement of sodium and potassium ions throughout this process. Uh, talk about refractory periods and then we'll finish up with a process known as saltatory conduction by which this process is sped up uh, through uh, covering the axon with the myelin sheath. In the central nervous system this is conducted via oligodendrocytes and in the peripheral nervous system via Schwann cells. Well, let's start with postsynaptic potentials. So the resting membrane of, of, of the resting potential of a membrane remains stable and until a neuron is stimulating, is stimulated. This produces three possibilities. First is hyperpolarization. This increases the polarization or the difference between the electrical charge of the two places. So um, basically what we've done in, with a, a hyperpolarization is we have increased the amount of charge uh, within the neuron. So essentially we've made the charge more negative. This is known as an inhibitory postsynaptic potential or an IPSP. In order to generate a neural signal, we actually have to depolarize the cell. And so by hyperpolarizing the cell, we make it less likely that an action potential is going to be generated because now we have a greater level of excitation necessary in order to get a neuron to fire. Hyperpolarization, uh, again, is an IPSP. Depolarization occurs um, when we start moving the um, electrical charge towards zero. So we're making it less negative. It's kind of a weird way to talk. But essentially, we're making it so there is a lower level of charge across the membrane. This is known as an excitatory postsynaptic potential, or an EPSP, because it's pushing that neuron towards its threshold level, uh, at which point it will generate an action potential. So that third possibility here is we will depolarize the cell sufficiently to cross what's called the threshold of excitation. This is a level above which any stimulation will produce a massive depolarization or an action potential. And that is the whole process by which everything is accomplished in the brain is the generation of these electrical signals called action potentials. Uh, in a later lecture, we're going to talk about how um, these action potentials and their firing rates and sort of volley firing and a bunch of neurons firing at once are measured. So for example, in single cell recordings, we might measure um, what's called the firing rate of a neuron, uh, in which case we look at whether or not stimulation increases or decreases the firing rate of that neuron. And then we can actually measure uh, the occurrence of these action potentials in large numbers uh, by putting electrodes on the scalp of participants and measuring electrical activity in the brain. So these um, action potentials are an important part of understanding uh, the entire cognitive neuroscience uh, field. So an action potential is again the rapid depolarization of a neuron. Uh, the threshold at which an action potential will be generated will vary from one neuron to another, but it is consistent for each neuron. Uh, and so essentially we're going to depolarize the cell sufficiently until we get an action potential. What's important about this is this is an all or none process. Once we've crossed that level of uh, that threshold, uh, the neuron's going to fire. It's not going to fire a bigger amount. It's not going to fire a smaller amount. It's just going to fire. Now, we do have graded potentials, which are those excited, excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. Uh, and we won't dive into that very deeply, but just understand when people talk about a graded potential, they're talking about excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, which then influence whether or not a cell generates an action potential. So stimulation of that neuron past the threshold of excitation will trigger that action potential. Uh, and again, this occurs, it's kind of like flicking a switch. Um, the light's going to come on, um, but essentially this is going to fire one signal. Uh, and neurons can do this about a thousand times a second. And so you can actually fire about a thousand action potentials in one second. And that's going to become functionally important later on. So this is kind of a basic overview of what the action potential is. And it's occurring because of voltage-gated ion channels. So membrane channels uh, 
um, whose permeability depends upon the voltage difference across the membrane are these voltage gated voltage gated ion channels. And this is occurring when uh, an excitatory postsynaptic potential has stimulated these ion channels sufficiently to trigger an action potential. So we get this massive depolarization. So when they're opened, these positively charged sodium ions rush in and depolarize the cell, triggering an action potential. So remember, sodium ions are primarily outside the cell, and that's part of what maintains this electrical difference. When those positively charged ions rush into the cell, it depolarizes the cell and can trigger an action potential. These ion channels then allow the action potential to be regenerated as it propagates the length of a neuron. So essentially, that signal is regenerated at each point along the way. Uh, as we open those ion channels, it generates a signal which opens the next ion channel, which generates a signal which opens the next ion channel, etc. So it's actually propagating down the length of a neuron. Um, it's not really like electricity traveling through a wire where we have electrons just traveling down a wire. What we have then is the opening and closing of these ion channels, which generates this signal. So um, action potential occurs because sodium channels open, sodium rushes into the cell. After that occurs, these sodium channels are quickly closed and the neuron is then returned to its resting state by the opening of potassium channels and the functioning of the um, uh, sodium potassium pump. So potassium ions with these uh, channels open will flow out to the concentration gradient and will take with them their positive charge. And then the sodium potassium pump will later restore the original distribution of ions. And so we'll have to work to get potassium back into the cell and sodium back out of the cell. Uh, via that sodium potassium pump. So every time an action potential is generated, it's energy intensive to the cell because remember each sodium potassium pump, every time it runs through a cycle has to have um, ATP in order to make that happen. And there's a lot of sodium potassium pumps in each neuron and a lot of neurons. So your brain's a really metabolically intensive area uh, and uses up a lot of that ATP. So here's basic look at what this might look like. We have a neuron that's just hanging out, we start to get some excitation. So we might get uh, an excitatory postsynaptic potential, and then we might get another excitatory postsynaptic potential. And then we're going to cross that level of excitation, and uh, we're going to get this resulting electrical potential that you see. Uh, and so then as the uh, cell starts to return to its normal state, it's going to um, be in what we call an absolute refractory period. So it can't generate another neuron in this time frame. And again, this is about a millisecond, so you can do this about a thousand times a second. Now, as we start sort of returning to our negative 70 millivolts, uh, the neuron will overshoot. That is, it will be hyperpolarized for a short period of time. This is what we call a relative refractory period, and we'll talk about this again here in just a moment. Um, but essentially, the neuron can fire, but it's going to take a little more effort. You're going to have to excite it more. It's going to need a greater level of excitation. So here's what's happening during this time frame. We have the opening of these ion channels. We have sodium pouring in, and then we have these potassium ions exiting. And this is the period at which we end up with uh, an overshooting as we're trying to restore that sodium-potassium balance. So the process of restoring the sodium potassium pump to its original distribution of ions takes time. Uh, an unusually rapid series of action potentials can actually lead to a buildup of sodium within the axon, uh, and that can actually cause brain damage. Um, and so overexcitation of a neuron can cause that uh, neuron to rupture because of that buildup of sodium within the axon. And so we want to be very careful about that. And it's one of the ways in which some drugs can be uh, neurotoxic. Uh, Quick sort of note about those sodium channels. There are actually drugs that block that sodium channel and prevent an action potential from occurring at all. And these are drugs like Novocaine, Lidocaine, Xylocaine, Cocaine, um, are all what we call topical anesthetics. Um, and that's essentially what your dentist is doing uh, in this photograph, is injecting uh, Novocaine into a nerve and causing that nerve to not be able to generate action potentials because those sodium channels have been blocked. So essentially what Novocaine is doing is it's preventing a cell from generating an action potential at all. And so essentially it blocks neural firing entirely. And so whenever you have some kind of a nerve block, that's what they're doing is they're blocking up those sodium channels so that those action potentials uh, can't be generated. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have um, 
refractory periods. Um, after an action potential, a neuron cannot fire anymore. So this refractory period occurs when a neuron will resist the production of another action potential or can't produce one at all. So that absolute refractory period uh, lasts for about a millisecond. And so that neuron cannot fire again during that time period because it has to restore uh, the ion balance. This uh, first millisecond or so, it's that first part of the period in which the membrane cannot produce an action potential. The relative refract refractory period is the second part here in yellow um, in which it takes a stronger than usual stimulus to trigger an action potential. It can, you can trigger an action potential after that millisecond or so time period but it's going to take a greater level of excitation. So we need a stronger stimulus to get that action potential to fire again. So these are these refractory periods. So quick summary of the action potential. We have a stimulus. Eventually we cross that threshold of excitation. Um, we depolarize the cell. Sodium rushes in. We start to repolarize as potassium leaves the cell. So then we uh, hyperpolarize. We sort of, you know, end up past our target of um, membrane potential, and then we get it back to its normal resting membrane potential. And again, this all happens within milliseconds. Final note, uh, I want to talk about saltatory conduction. Uh, white matter in the brain and throughout the peripheral nervous system uh, occurs because of the myelin sheath. These are axon, axons. Um, are covered by a myelin sheath. Uh, which basically covers those ion channels. And what that does is it allows uh, an action potential to propagate down an axon faster because it doesn't have to travel the entire length. What it does is it actually generates the action potential at these nodes of RNVA. And so these unmyelinated, unmyelinated sections uh, are the areas in which an action potential is generated. So myelin is an insulating material composed of fats and proteins. And at each node of RANVA, the action potential is regenerated again by a chain of positively charged ions pushed along by the previous segment. So saltatory conduction means jumping in some dead language. And essentially what happens is this action potential jumps from one node to the next. And so what happens is rather than traveling the full length of the axon, it can skip from one node to the other. So it happens much faster. So that jumping of the action potential from node to node provides rapid conduction of impulses, conserves energy for the cell because it doesn't have to open as many ion channels. And as I said earlier, unfortunately, multiple sclerosis is a disease in which the myelin sheath is destroyed by the body's immune system. Uh, and it's associated with poor muscle coordination, sometimes sensory and visual impairments. Uh, and eventually, uh, because of the degradation of that myelin sheath, uh, we get loss of functioning altogether. So here we have um, this look, well, it looks like it would be in the peripheral nervous system. In the peripheral nervous system, each segment of myelon, uh, my, myelon, myelin is a um, single Schwann cell. Uh, in the central nervous system, an oligodendrocyte would actually send out multiple projections to cover this area. But then you can see these nodes of RANVA, and these nodes of RNVA are where that action potential occurs. So rather than having to travel the full length of the axon, it jumps from one of these nodes to the next and very quickly travels that um, length of the axon rather than having to open ion channels all along the way. So that is the action potential, a very important part of understanding neuroscience. Uh, we'll be referring back to uh, things that have influenced the action potential later on. Uh, it's an important part of understanding memory formation through what's called long-term potentiation. And so we'll talk about this in great detail. So make sure you have, uh, have this down uh, and revisit this if you need to.